It's either as a bootkit or in some cases as a firmware implant as we'll see later. What's good also is that code here is hidden from the OS and the hypervisor. So antivirus EDRs or anti-cheat engines won't, won't, won't see these things, right? Now in terms of privilege level, this is just a simplification, but we can think it about like this. We have our applications, like for instance our browser, running at the very top, ring three. Then we have our OS, ring zero, and if we have a hypervisor, it's down the OS, of course, and only then we have SMM. Now, how does this work? We can divide the uh, the thing in, in, in two, two phases. We have boot time, where the firmware BIOS UFI code will, after initializing the, the hardware, will load the SMM code into an special area of memory called SM RAM. And then it will hand off the execution to the OS loader, then the OS loads. And as you can see, SMM is just a runtime concept. It will provide services for the, for the platform, for instance, power management, security, and the OS can invoke some services from it as well. So how does that happen? Well, there's this con concept of system management interrupt. When an SMI occurs, the processor gets interrupted, and then this, the, the current register set of the processor is saved into the SM RAM, into a safety area, and then whatever needs to happen happens, some um, good feature for the system, and it then comes back to the OS. In this case, we are doing a synchronous SMI, like a software SMI, the OS is um, invoking a, a service from SMM. Now, we've been working on this area for a bit. Um, we published some, some blogs, we've done some, some presentations before, how are you on Hexacon. We have a couple of CVEs in 2023 and we also released some tools for um, checking for misconfigurations and known issues. Um, all of these things that we've done before are mostly related to either misconfigurations from vendors or software vulnerabilities in components. Now, what we're going to present today is an architectural flaw in the AMD processor itself. So that's very different. And so for that, we're going to just see again what is what makes the security of SMM. So we can think on the CPU when it's an SMM mode, we have the memory controller in the middle, and we can just access this area with wh where the SMM code and data lives. We can execute instructions from this area, we can write to this area and read. However, when the CPU is in normal mode, meaning non-SMM, the memory controller just rejects um, if, if, if you read from this, uh, um, from this memory, you're just going to return, re receive Fs, writes are discarded, and of course execution is disallowed. How does it hap how is this happening? Well, we have um, what's called a TSEC region, or top of memory segment region. Essentially the firmware, after, l loads, uh, after it loads SMM at boot time, it will hopefully configure these two registers, and the idea is to overlap um, have this region to overlap with all the contents of SM RAM to protect it. We have uh, two registers, we have the TSEC base and the TSEC mask, which is the length. The TSEC, ma the TSEC mask, as you can see, have also ad additional fields. And yeah, essentially this is the way. The memory controller will see that uh, the CPU is executing in normal mode and would just reject to read the content or write the content of the SM RAM. Has to be enabled, uh, that's why the T valid bit is there. Now, the layout of SM RAM uh, basically is up to the vendor to define, but most systems out there are going to follow what the EDK2 has, which is Tiano Core, which is reference code. And uh, essentially, it's going to consist at the very bottom, you can see here um, SMM Core area. This is just supporting code for the rest of, uh, of what's going to be in there. And then for each core, we're going to have an SMM base. And at a specific offset, 8,000 from the SMM base, we're going to have the entry point, which is where the processor, the, the core, is going to start executing from when the SMI happens. And then we have a safe state at offset FE00. This is Tiano core, right? It can be laid out differently by the vendor. And then we have the SMI handlers at the very top, which is, are going to be the functions that are, are going to be useful for, for us, for the system, handling power, security, or whatever. Um, so yeah, just a summary of the SM RAM registers. We have the three that we just mentioned, and we also have an SMM block. That's very important. Hopefully, the firmware code is gonna set this bit so that the 
whatever runs at runtime, the OS cannot tamper with these registers. We don't want, for example, at runtime, having the OS disabling the TSEC location, because this will just um, update or change the code at the SMRAM location and execute with these additional privileges, right? Now, this needs to be configured for each core. With that, we can see a first difference between how Intel and AMD manage the access to MSRs. On Intel systems, these MSRs that are related to SMM are only accessible while the CPU is in SMM. In fact, obtaining the SMM base, for example, on Intel, could be considered a leak. On AMD, all these MSRs are accessible from ring zero, no problem. Again, if we have the SMM lock bit set, then the configuration cannot be changed. Not even SMM can change the configuration until the next power cycle in which, I mean, the firmware will take over again and configure this in the same way. But we can now spot the bug in the documentation. This is the same TSEC mask register and the fields, just a picture from the documentation. We can see how the SMM lock is covering all of the fields except for two over there. These two fields are going to be what we're going to be talking about um, in this session. And we have T close and A close. Um, we're just going to focus on T close. A close it stands for um, the same feature, but for uh, a previous region called ASEC, which is overlaps on the video memory. It's not used anymore, so it doesn't matter. But what happens is when this bit is set, the data accesses that the core that the core performs when it's running in SMM are going to be directed to MMIO instead of to SM RAM. And that's, that's, that's cool because as we said before, we could set this bit from ring zero because it's not locked by the SMM lock, right? It actually, in the, in the A close description, it also says, hey, I mean, don't forget to unset this when you're returning from SMM because otherwise your safety are going to be erroneously read from MMIO. That's bad. Um, the documentation says as well, hey, if you have a valid TSEC region and you're in SMM and the T-close is set, then instruction fetches are still going to be directed to DRAM, but data accesses are going to go to MMIO instead. If you're not in SMM, then both accesses, both type of accesses are going to go to MMIO. So we can say um, x86 behaves in a Harvard, like a Harvard architecture, goes to Harvard, right? If we have um, our core, core zero, for example, running in normal mode, both data and instruction fetches just go to MMIO. If we have our core zero now in SMM with the T close off, this is what happens. No problem. We read and in execute from SM RAM. However, when we set T close on, now data fetches go like this. And this is a problem because this portion can be controlled by an attacker. So triggering the condition is super easy. We just need to. Uh, set this, this bit, this T-close bit and call into an SMI and the system will immediately freeze, hang or you're going to spot the problem right there. This feature exists because um, well AMD wanted to have the ability to reuse the physical address space and have SMM code um, access an IO device that were using the same SM RAM uh, physical memory essentially. Um, we haven't seen any vendor using this feature. Um, but yeah, that's why. And it was on, on what we could track is in 2006, there was this document that first mentioned the feature. So it means it's been around at least for 18 years. Now, for people familiarized with um, biosecurity, they're probably going to remember this vulnerability presented by Christopher Thomas in 2015 called the memory sinkhole attack. And what happened was that he was able to remap the APIC, which is a specific device um, in the, um, available, and overlap it with the TSEC area, and it caused the same effect. Uh, data fetches will go to MMIO instead of SMRAM. Now, the difference here, of course, is that oh, that was only limited to the APIC, and it only affected the 4K region where the APIC was overlapped with. The scene close behavior changed uh, how the entire TSEC works. Um, any device in theory could be overlap, right? Because we just direct any access to the MMIO space. So we can bring some, some attack ideas in. Our easy thing will be, the, the easiest thing will be to just grab any PCI device and hopefully we'll have a good register layout on its bar. 
so that we could take control of the execution at the very beginning of the entry point. As there are multiple integrated devices that we could use, we could just try remapping one of those. And based on what we read, the register should become visible at the TSEC location from the OS. However, this failed. We can see here how uh, we have an Ethernet controller uh, with its original uh, BAR2 uh, D071-4000. We have some registers right here. They're visible registers. And we're going to try to overlap, when we try to overlap it with the SMM entry uh, BFEV000, we can see that we're still reading Fs. So the remapping failed. Registers are not available. Um, we can see that the registers were moved from their original location. They're, they're, something happened. When we restore, we can see the registers again. So it's not that we broke anything. So it's just the, the, the priority of the memory probably failed, right? So when that, that led us to try to understand, okay, how that does, how, how is that working? Have this register called top of memory or TOM. Um, this thing defines a limit between the usable DRAM before four gigabytes on the physical address space and MMIO space on top. Now, on Intel, this register has a lock bit. Once it's configured, you cannot tamper with it anymore at runtime. But on AMD, it doesn't have the, such a lock, so we could just, you know, modify this, and maybe that's good for us. The idea is simple. We'll have this is, uh, imagine this is the layout, right? And we'll move the MMIO space of the TOM that defines the MMIO space to match with the TSEC base. So we have something like that. Maybe then trying the same trick that we uh, did before could work. Unfortunately, we could move the TSEC, no problem, but it didn't change the behavior that we saw before. In practice, it didn't work. So that led us to <laughs> dig, dig, dig uh, deeper into, into the documentation, and we found there are some actual priorities when the core access um, some portion of the physical address space. Essentially, the term is wh where it's going. And we can see that the TSEC and ASEC mechanisms are listed four which means one, two, and three, whatever is listed there, has less, less priority than this. And at the, at the number one, we can see the TOM is, is, is listed there. So we have, it, that's why it never worked, right? It would have never worked. What's at five, where we have the MMIO configuration space and the APIC? Uh, that makes sense. We, the APIC was used before in the Intel attack. The MMIO config space we cannot use, really. Um, and then at six, we have this Norbridge address space uh, routing, but uh, that probably stands for all their architectures. This is not seen in modern, modern stuff, so we cannot use it. For the APIC, we cannot really use it, and we're going to explain why. But for that, we need to give an analysis of, of um, how the SMM entry point code works. When the, SMM, when the SMI occurs, the SMM core, uh, the, the core um, executing at SMM starts executing in real mode, in 16-bit mode, flat, no protection whatsoever. What it has to do is quickly go to protected mode, 32-bit, and then goes to long mode, and then passes the execution to the handlers. This is a very simplified view. Now, that first step, going to, from real mode to protected mode, is, is key, right? That's the first thing that needs to happen. For this, um, on x86, we need essentially an, our enabled segmentation. Uh, segmentation provides um, the ability to, for the for the core to see the memory in a segmented way. That's that's how it's called. Essentially, we can have different segments for memory and assign uh, different permissions or like um, the ability to execute code or, or, or just read data and stuff like that. We have this key data structure called global descriptor table of GD or GDT, and we have a register on the processor that is called GDTR that's going to point to the base of our GDT structure and it's going to have a limit in bytes. And so the GDT is just really an array of descriptors. And we have different types of descriptors. We have, we have code descriptors, data descriptors. Each one is going to have a base. The first one is never used. That's why it's called, it's called null descriptor. But then when we have a jump, you can see we'll have um, a jump. It's not only having an offset, like a target location, but it's also going to have like a, a segment selector right here. That segment selector picks the descriptor we're going to use for, the, for, for our, our code segment. And then the, the, the offset is added to the base that is indicated by the GDT, forming the final linear address. With that, we can do a, an analysis of um, the EDK2 SMM entry point. Essentially, um, 
we can see that at the very beginning we are moving into the register BX the entry point plus 4D. This is in, this is a decom like um, extracted from a, from from a compiled um, SMM code. So you can see at 4D right there we have a GDC description ready to 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 be loaded into the GDTR. The next instruction that matters for us is the low GDT. This is instruction that is going to load the GDTR with the content that BX points to. And finally, we have a jump over here that's going to perform the actual um, going into protected mode. And it has the selector of, co of code as, as well and the offset. Now, with this, what, what will happen if we over overlap a device that we control on the entry point and we control offset 4D? Well, what will happen is that the low GDT will be loading something that we control so we can load our own fake GDT, right? So that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to get control over the offset 4D with any device that we can find so that the, the fake GDT then provides the descriptors what we need and we can take control and jump down there. That's the whole idea of the attack. And that's why the APIC is a problem. Two things. First, the system becomes unstable when the APIC is moved. Super unstable. Second, the APIC registers are not useful for taking control in the way we need. We can see that at 4D we have these reserved regions with all zeros. Writes are discarded here. We're not in able to control here. And if we load a GDTR with all zeros, we're essentially saying to the processor, hey, here's an empty GDT. So this won't work. And at this point, we found another device not documented by the, the, the specification that also has priority over uh, the TSEC region. That's the spy controller, and Christoph's going to describe it for us. Good job. All right. So the spy controller is a very nice device for us because it's present in all the systems we've tested, and it's basically used to access the spy flash on um, AMD uh, systems. So, for example, for reading, writing, erasing the spy flash, it, it always goes for the spy controller. And it has a couple of key features that are really uh, interesting to us. First of all, we can relocate the bar over the SMM entry point. Secondly, the portions which are interesting to us at offset 4D, we can control them. And three, it actually takes precedence over uh, SMRAM when TCOS is enabled. So with that in mind, what we will do for our attack is simply take the spy bar, relocate it over the SMM entry point of core zero, and then afterwards manipulate the values at offset 4D within that bar. Um, the um, registers that actually, that actually correspond to that portion of memory in the bar uh, are the memory range and run protection zero register. Those were used in the past to uh, lock down next to the spy flash, but mostly these are not configured and not fixed, so we can fully control them. On some, system, some systems they are fixed, but actually they are fixed to values which are still useful for us. So before I dive into the exploit, uh, I also want to uh, show you a little bit our debugging stuff because it's a little bit special. Um, so we are facing actually two challenges uh, when we try to develop the exploit. First of all, we didn't really have a way to know whether our payload ran because the system just crashes, reboots, and memory is just all wiped. Uh, and secondly, we didn't really have any debugging framework for SMM. Um, and like for example when crashes happen we want to be able to modify the code however we see fit. So to resolve the first issue we actually took a PCI squirrel which is typically used with PCI leech for DMA attacks but the nice thing about it is actually is that it has a bar buffer as we call it where when we write to it it actually survives across reboots. So for, for instance our payload can write a value to, uh, to the bar buffer kind of like a checkpoint so we know it ran and then when the system reboots it's still going to be there. Right. And if we want to modify for example for the second issue if we want to modify uh, code in SMM for some extra debugging capabilities for that we just um, injected a firmware implant uh, that loads a nice SMM module that allows us to do all of that. So the setup looks like this. We just have the PCI squirrel connected to our target device via an M2 uh, adapter and all of this is powered externally by a power supply. So it's time to get our hands dirty. So let's take a look at how uh, the exploit looks like. In the first attempt, uh, we remap the spy bar, just like mentioned before, over the SMM entry point of core zero. Then we tweak uh, these values at offset 4D. We create a fake GDT in the beginning of the address space uh, with, the, with a nice base address that will allow us, when the jump happens, to redirect execution to our own payload. 
And then when we uh, execute the SMM entry point code with TCOS enabled, what's going to happen is uh, the LGDT is actually going to load the GDT register uh, with a value that points to our own fake GDT. So that's great. And afterwards, when the jump happens, a descriptor from the fake GDT is going to be taken that we control. Um, and it's going to be used as a base uh, for the jump. So, and um, this is going to redirect the execution like this, at least in theory. So, um, an interesting detail is actually how we pick the base address in the GDT descriptor. Um, and for that, we have to understand how it normally executes and how it executes with T close in this case. So, um, when the forward jump happens um, and the uh, normal execution, what happens is the GDT register is going to point to a GDT within SM RAM where it's nicely protected. Um, and the segment selector is going to index into that table um, and the base is going to be actually fixed to zero, which means with a base of zero, when we add it uh, to the far jump offset, what's going to happen is the linear address is going to be the same. Now, in our case, actually, we have a bit of an issue. We want to read the execution um, outside of TSEG. The only problem is that within the first four gigs of memory after TSEG, there's not really any spot where we can put a payload. Right? So if we increase the base a little bit, sure, the instruction pointer is going to go a bit more up, 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 and the address space, but we don't really have DRAM over there that we control. So we wondered, okay, what happens if we actually increase the base such that when we, uh, the base of the GDT descriptor, such that when we add it to the far jump offset, it actually overflows? Um, yeah? It just overflows. <laughs> so we thought, okay, this isn't going to be possible, but actually it was. And this is nice because uh, if we choose the base efficiently big and we add the offset, we can actually make it wrap around and make it jump to our own payload in the beginning of the physical address space. The beginning of the physical address space, we have DRAM there. Great. We control all of that. So uh, that was one of the key takeaways actually that we had from the research as well. So this worked. Our payload actually ran and we saw this because it would write a value, this nice checkpoint to our bar buffer, but the system would crash and we wondered, okay, why is this happening? Um, the reason was the SMM save state. So like Enrique mentioned, when a CPU goes to SMM mode, it actually saves the current register state into the uh, SMM save state. When it returns, it just restores it. What happens is when TCOS is enabled, actually the writes when the core enters SMM are going to be discarded, which means when we return with TCOS disabled, actually it's just going to use stale values that were still there that were stored before. And to resolve this, the trick is actually pretty straightforward. We trigger the SMA twice. One time um, without T-close and the second time with T-close. So we first put the core zero into a known controlled state and then trigger an SMI without T-close. This is going to prime the SMM safe state. And afterwards when we trigger the bug with T-close enabled, the code is going to go for the same execution path and it's just going to reuse the values that we stored before. So that worked, but unfortunately it crashed again. But this time around we did see actually that, the, uh, that core zero was returning from SMM, so that was great. We had full control of core zero. OS code was running. We saw our checkpoints. Great. But no matter what we tried, this damn thing was still crashing. Um, so we spent an eternity debugging this thing until we stumbled into this. When we enable T-close, what happens is we enable it on core zero only, but actually it gets enabled on both cores, core zero and core one. Um, and we found that the culprit for this is symmetric multi-threading. So this is AMD's implementation of Intel hyper-threading. Um, and what it does is it divides a physical core into two logical cores. And some of the resources on these logical cores are shared and some of them are not. So for instance, the SMM base MSR is separate, so every logical core has a different base MSR. But the TSEC mask is actually shared, which is what we just saw, right? And we wondered, is this the actual issue? Because we assumed when an SMI gets triggered that only one core goes into SMM at a time. And we put this to the test, and what we saw is the following. When we have multiple cores running in normal mode, so outside of SMM, um, when, we, when one of them triggers an SMI, an interrupt gets asserted on all of the cores, and all of the cores are going to go into SMM mode and going to start ex executing the SMM entry point code um, for, uh, for each and one of them. So, our assumptions were actually wrong, right? We assumed SMIs are local, 
but they're actually not. And we thought that this was actually the case because the IDK2 code has a so-called rendezvous routine, which will, every time you enter into SMM, this routine is going to be triggered. And that core which entered into SMM will send an explicit interprocessor interrupt to all of the logical cores to explicitly pull them from whatever state they were in into SMM. And well, what's the point of that if actually all the cores are always going to SMM anyway, right? Um, and we dug a little bit deeper into the documentation and we found that the IO hub seems to be responsible for this to uh, basically assert this interrupt on all of the cores. So we're out of luck. So to summarize, we had all cores always going to SMM and T cores being enabled on two cores at the same time and not just one as we initially thought. And this will actually make just core one go haywire, right? We have control of core zero, but core one is uh, just going to go nuts and crash the whole system. So to tackle the problem, we had to get control of core one some way. Uh, and we dug deep into our bag of tricks to really uh, see if maybe there's a nice elegant solution to this to just take core one out of the running. Um, so we tried to, um, and we tried to find another device to overlap with the entry point of core one. There was none. Uh, we tried to disable SMT in the BIOS. That also didn't work. We tried to uh, use the uh, so-called init API and also the SKNet instruction to put core one into a state that would actually make it ignore SMIs. That also didn't work. And finally, we also tried to send a so-called SMI API, which, at least according to the documentation, would allow us to trigger an SMI on individual cores. And it also didn't work. So despite the documentation indicating one thing, in practice, we didn't manage to uh, get it to work. So we're running out of options. And we had to take a step back and analyze the problem. And we realized, OK, the LGDT is the actual problem. Because it's going to be load, loading the GDT register with all Fs, right? So is, this, is there maybe some way we can actually still take advantage of this? Um, so when the SMM entry point normally executes, what happens with the GDT register is it's going to be loaded with a nice value for the base. It's going to be pointing to the GDT within uh, SMRAM, right? And afterwards, the segment selector is going to be taken, added to it, uh, and the base within that uh, descriptor is going to be used to calculate the final linear address. Now, in our case, what's going to happen when TICOS is enabled, uh, the GDT register is going to be loaded with all Fs, both the limit and the base. And what's going to happen then is, when the far jump, the segment selector is going to be added to it. And once again, we have our good old friend, integer overflow, it's actually going to result in the physical address 7. And this is actually awesome because address 7 in the physical address space, once again, that's DRAM. We control DRAM. So we can take advantage of that. We can put our GDT at the beginning of DRAM and we can just overflow this thing like this. And afterwards, uh, from the GDT we control, we set a nice base so that afterwards uh, the code jumps wherever we want it to. So to summarize, we have Two types of wraparounds. One is between the GDT descriptor base and the far jump offset. And the second one between the GDT register base and the far jump segment selector. And the nice thing about this is we can actually reuse the same fake GDT for both core zero and core one. And the added bonus is we don't even need the spy bar anymore. The only thing that we really have to take care of is the SMM safe state, once again, for core one. For core zero, we just do the same thing as before. But core one is going to be running in some unknown state. It could be running ring three, ring zero, just in an unknown context. We have to bring it to uh, the same controlled state as core zero. And we do so by using a kernel synchronization API, which on Windows is the deferred procedure call, or on Linux, uh, symmetric multiprocessing. And basically, once that's done, uh, we have both cores in a known state. And we can use the same trick we did uh, use for core zero. So all good things are three, so let's try again. The exploit this time is greatly simplified, and well, the only thing we have to do is we create a fake GDT in the beginning of the address space, we choose the um, base address within the descriptor accordingly, and that's it. And then when we trigger, when we enable tclose and run the uh, SMM entry point code again, the LGDT this time around is going to point to the very end of the address space of the first four gigs. But then when the far jump happens, it's going to wrap around. It's going to fetch the GDT descriptor entry from the beginning of the address space from our fake GDT. 
and then afterwards it's going to redirect execution for both core 0 and core 1 to our own payload. And that finally worked. Well, we managed to control both cores, core 0 and core 1. Uh, our payload would execute with SMM privileges and uh, it would return gracefully from SMM to the operating system and nothing would crash. And that was great. There were only a couple of things that we wanted to improve uh, in our exploit and that was um, to reload the GDT because the base actually is um, a bit off. <laughs> so we just reload the GDT so that the base address is zero again to, so that we don't have strange misalignment issues. We set up long modes, uh, so page tables, stack pointer, etc., so we can execute like uh, any C code that we want. Uh, and then we also install an SMI handler so that we only have to exploit the bug once, and then basically we have kind of semi persistence until the system resets, right? So for the demo, just to show you, I'm not selling just some snake, snake oil. Uh, we have a system over here which is a Huawei MateBook D16 from. 2023. And you can see when the system boots, it actually shows the Huawei logo. That logo is embedded in the firmware code. For that, um, so for our exploit, we're actually going to modify that, uh, that logo. So um, we're going to run an exploit with uh, kernel privileges. So you'll see over here that we have to elevate privileges and it's going to be triggered via a malicious driver. And then our exploit is going to do uh, three things. At first, it's going to use the synclose issue to elevate privileges to SMM. Then it's going to disable the spy flash protections. And then afterwards, it's going to write to the spy flash the portion where the um, uh, boot splash logo is actually residing. This takes a little while, about 15 minutes. So we just fast forward that portion. And you can see, OK, it shows done patching, all good. And at this point, we just reset the system and pray that it works. So let's see. Yeah, this one takes a little while. And there we go. It was successful. So I mean, this was just one example of what we can do with this kind of access into the system, but let's take a more systematic approach to see whether this works like on all systems, just on some. What does this actually depend on? So the next attack pa um, paths depend on how the platform is actually configured. Um, so every vendor configures certain features that uh, AMD provides to them, and specifically there are two of them which are key to this. One is ROM armor, which can be used to restrict access to the portions of the spy flash. And the second one is Platform Secure Boot, which is AMD's equivalent of Boot Guard, which will verify the initial stages of the firmware code. Um, so if everything is enabled, the very le least thing that we can do is we can write to a portion of the spy flash where UFE variables live. So for instance, in these variables, you're going to have things like the secure boot uh, keys, which I used. So we can break secure boot. That's nice. Um, but if nothing is enabled, actually, we have firmware implants. And I'm going to explain in a moment uh, what the difference actually is. So in the first configuration, whenever, where everything is uh, properly configured, we see, OK, we escalate from the operating system to SMM. And from there, we can write to the, let's say, firmware uh, data portion of the spy flash where the configurations are. So we can manipulate like secure boot keys so that afterwards we can actually load our own malicious bootloader before the OS loader runs. And the second configuration where the PSB is not enabled, we have basically the same scenario. Um, ROM armor st st will still restrict write access to, um, to the data portion. And we can, we can still just um, uh, inject our own bootkit. And the third configuration, we can write to even firmware code, but that's going to be still verified by Platform Secure Boot. So OK, and these three we have the same scenario, we can just inject a boot kit, which is still nice because it runs before the OS loader. Any protections provided by the operating system would still be um, rendered null. But in the last scenario where none of these features uh, are enabled, what we can do is we can inject our uh, malware into the spy flash, into the firmware code portion of it. And when that happens, uh, is what we're going to get is we can um, run our own malware at the very earliest stage of the boot process. And there's a key difference here between a firmware implant and uh, a bootkit is that this 
attack actually is resistant to, uh, to OS reinstallations. So even if you wipe your drive, it's still going to be around. Um, and even if you try to push a firmware update from the operating system, it's still going to be around because the, uh, the malware can just say, well, the update was su successful. Um, and the only way to really get rid of it at that point is to take apart your system, take a spy programmer to read out the spy flash, inspect it, and if it's infected, um, just uh, rewrite it. But typically it's not really in the repertoire of a typical IT guy, right? <laughs> So to illustrate how prevalent actually these misconfigurations are, we did some research last year on that, and we saw that the majority of the systems have none of the security features actually enabled, which means all the systems which have none of the features enabled are vulnerable to firmware implants, which is pretty bad. And to put a cherry on top, we also found that once you're infected with that kind of uh, firmware implant, you can even disable platform secure boot forever by burning a specific fuse, so that your system remains vulnerable to firmware uh, implant reinfections forever. Sweet. So, let's wrap up the presentation. Thanks, Christoph. So, yeah, in terms of affected systems, right? Pretty much all of them. Uh, yeah, um, our tests were on Ryzen mostly, several laptops. Uh, but it turns out the Threat Reaper series is also affected, Epic series is also affected, meaning servers. Um, and yeah, uh, due to the longevity of this, this, this thing, we can estimate the total number of affected chips are in around the hundreds of millions. Um, there's an advisory from AMD published now um, where more information on the system, the affected systems and cover, uh, the, there's a microcode update now. Information is there, um, so you can check. Mitigations. Yeah, AMD, as I just said, provided um, with microcode updates. However, it might not cover all of the affected systems, of course. Um, in terms of what an OEM can do, they can just modify the SMM entry point code to detect if the T close bit is set. And if it is, then just abort the execution, and this, this will just render the exploitation unfeasible. Uh, this can even be done at the EDK2 level for AMD systems, right? And we, we really haven't covered here core boot, but core boot is affected in the same way. We just, I mean, um, core boot at the very beginning of the entry point performs the low GDT. Uh, they have to go to protected mode as well, so it's, it's the same thing. Um, and actually, core boot, they are checking for, this, uh, for, for, for other issues as well of the entry point, so they could, they could very well do this. Um, and users, oh, they can, you know, a hypervisor could trap the access on the TSEC mask MSR, so that's another uh, way to stop this. Timeline-wise, well, we reported this back in October 2023, a CVE of 2023, uh, 31, was assigned in November. And then we discussed mitigations and impact with AMD over the course of the next months. Um, and yeah, finally, yesterday, um, the advisory was published and we are here at DEF CON today. This was the official AMD response. Essentially, we worked with them in a process of uh, responsible disclosure. And yeah, they've been great to work with. Conclusions and takeaways. Well, the vulnerability has been around for nearly two decades. Um, the complexity of the architecture clearly plays in favor of attackers, and we see this uh, with the flexibility of, of, of the GDT on the two types of wraparounds, the, the, the byte level uh, um, address, um, like granularity that there is with it, no problem. Um, and also with the how the MSRs can be accessed without any restriction. Uh, that, that's, that's all good for attackers, right? Um, these things combined are what made this exploit approach possible. There might be on other exploit methods too. Um, but yeah, all of this of, of course requires an in-depth understanding of the architecture. And in the end, we managed to exploit this without requiring physical presence. So that's very good. And yeah, exploit code will be released soon. So stay tuned for that. 
questions. There is a question of name. Is there a microphone? Okay. Oh, switched off. Uh, uh, hello. Um, it wasn't entirely clear to me. Is the spy flash chip you're referring to on the uh, CPU die, or is it external? External. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Hi, how are you? We were talking with Enrique that this is interesting also to bypass an anti-cheat system, right, uh, in the video game industry. Um, PlayStation 5 runs on an MAD chip. Uh, is, is, is it also vulnerable, or is it uh, a different kind of chip and it doesn't affect it? Thank you. Um, so I'm sorry, if I, if I understood your question correctly, it was about bypassing uh, anti-cheat systems uh, using this method? Nope, installing something to bypass uh, the anti-cheat systems and... Uh, 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 once you achieve arbitrary code execution in SMM, uh, yeah, pretty much, uh, like, modern anti-cheat systems running uh, either kernel or even maybe at a hypervisor level could, could, could run, um, and this, this runs even below that, if that makes sense? Um, yeah, but uh, since uh, MAD has disclosed the processors that are vulnerable to this attack, it is, the, it is not disclosed in PlayStation 5 which has MAD. So that's what I was asking if maybe it's also, yeah. But, but yeah, I'm sorry, I, I don't know, uh, I, I don't understand your question correctly. <laughs> the the PlayStation 5 hypervisor blocks oh, yeah. the MSR. Oh, so uh, it's if it's for that, user. yes. The, the, yes, we, we check that. <laughs> and it is being trapped by the hypervisor layer yeah. on the place. Yes, sorry. <laughs> hey, thank you. Um, quick question. Um, why didn't disabling SMT prevent the system from becoming unstable? Uh, yes, so the SMT, when we try to disable it, um, essentially what happened is the other logical core will just not run, but it still be there and it will be, co the, all the entry points and, uh, uh, will be already configured by the firmware, if that makes sense. So when the SMI happens, it was a level underneath, I mean, it won't, you won't see the processor available at the OS level, but all, all the layout and, 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 and at the, at, yeah, at the deeper level, the, the logical color is still there, if that makes sense. Yes, it so does. So we have to deal with that regardless. Yes, we Got tried. It. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Do you know what uh, changes AMD microcode update made? Um, to I'm sorry, could you, could you speak up louder? Sorry. Uh, sorry. Do you know what changes AMD microcode update made to mitigate this issue? Oh, interesting question. Uh, yes. Uh, no, I mean, officially we don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, what, uh, we don't. <laughs> That's the long and short of it. <laughs> okay. uh, yes. I think we're good. <laughs> okay, well, if, if no more questions, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good job. Good job.